What is up, guys? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at. Go ahead and let me know in the comments here. If you're hearing my audio, seeing my video, everything's good to go. And while you're at it, maybe let me know where you're from. Cool, we've got Sam joining from San Jose. Very good, very good. I'm gonna be uh, curious to know if my, um, so I promoted this on Instagram, I think yesterday, and I think when I checked it this morning, the countdown timer I put on my Instagram story might've been off by a couple of hours. I don't know how that happened, but, um, if that did happen, we may see a fairly substantial, smaller audience this morning, but um, we'll see, should be a good time. Got Will from the UK, what's up? Pedro from Portugal. Pablo from San Jose, wait, San Jose, Costa Rica? We got a San Jose, California and a San Jose, Costa Rica, very cool. Oh goodness. How was everybody's week this past week? I'm going to I'm going to kill kill a couple minutes with some small talk before we get going um till more people pop in here. What's up? We got Teddy from Nigeria. Nice to nice to see you. We got Rishi from India. Gokul from Syracuse. What's up, man? We've been chatting on the Instagrams a bit more lately. Hope you're doing well. Awesome. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about staying motivated and staying inspired, which are some interesting topics. I think depending on who you ask, you might get a big range of responses on these topics, but um, but I think they're worth diving into. <clears throat> the two episodes of How to Render were published as private videos. What do you mean? What two episodes? Sorry. Uh, Zachary... I'm not sure which ones you're talking about. Um, sorry, you need to get more specific. I don't think anything is private. Mm, at least not supposed to be. Go cool. Looking at your Puget order update. Oh man, that's cool. So you just got a new computer. It'll be fun, man. Their, their customer support is killer. Um, anyone who's been watching my Instagram stories, I kind of leak little progress insights as to my uh, current computer setup. I've got a dual PC set up pretty much complete now. I'm finessing a couple things, but I had issues with loud, noisy fans, and I got that solved thanks to the kind folks at Puget who walked me through how to fix it. Uh, sweet, we got Nicola from Guatemala. Excellent. Nice to have you here. Cool. Cool. All right, we're about five minutes in. I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off. People can restart the live stream and watch it if they want, so. Okay, okay. Well, everyone, thanks for th thanks for visiting, thanks for joining again. Um, we're gonna be talking about staying motivated, staying inspired, and basically cranking out the good content that you uh, wanna be able to. So, Think of this, you're uh, actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead and dive in here. So here's the scenario, right? So if you're watching this, I am going to assume that you are a creative professional. So you don't have to be a designer, but somebody who, you know, generally does creative work. There's good chance that you're either working for yourself or maybe you're working for some really good company, but you do something creative. You have a lot of autonomy in your job, and therefore, staying motivated to keep working and staying inspired is just kind of part of it. Um, if you are, let's say, a an accountant, or you work in a job where you um, you have a very set, clear set of instructions of what you need to do, and you just kind of interact with people, and you you um, you know each each task that comes to you, you just go ahead and do it right away. Um, 
you could argue that sometimes those people in the, uh, sorry, those types of careers or tasks, you don't really need to stay inspired for. You just simply do. You just go and do the thing. Um, but in our case, if you are a creative professional, staying inspired and staying motivated is really key because you have so much control over what you do and don't do. And a lot of your success relies on or depends on you staying motivated, staying creative, staying inspired, and, and putting out the great work. And we all experience times where it's easier to work and times where it's harder to work. So I've compiled a bunch of tips and insights that I think will help you remain inspired when you don't feel like doing that work. So like I said, maybe you're a creative professional working for yourself, or maybe you're working for a really good company. Um, others probably envy your creative freedom. And um, from the outside, you know, everyone's like, man, you got such a great job. It looks like you just get to play. You just get to do fun things all day. And, you know, you probably were super excited when you started doing the job that you do now, uh, you, whether you're a student or a professional. I, I remember every career or job change I've had, I've been like, oh my gosh, this is too good to be true. I can't believe I'm actually doing this. Then you fast forward six months, maybe a year, maybe two years, and that initial excitement has worn off. And so we're talking about how do we keep that spark alive, right? Even as we've kind of, as our position may have grown a little stale, so to speak, it's not as exciting anymore. So we're already, so, so you know your privilege, you know that there was that spark, but what happened, right? So lately, maybe you've been lacking motivation or you've been procrastinating on the job that you actually need to do, um, finding ways to stay distracted instead of just staying focused on the task at hand. Um, maybe you find that it's just, it's hard to focus. You know, you sit down to do work, but you're just like, ah, your brain's got this like noise going on in it. So even though you might know you still have stuff to do, you just can't sit still. That's one of those things that like, again, I know that I might have some deadlines coming up, but I just can't seem to just sit down and do it. Um, another scenario is you might have a great opportunity, um, to, to do something creative, but then you, you lack that inspiration that we were talking about, you know? Um, and so here's another interesting thing. I know a lot of us have been working from home lately, not an office with peers. And it seems like that's actually exacerbated the situation. It's made them, it's made it harder to stay focused, to stay inspired, to stay creative, to stay, um, you know, have the motivation to keep doing those cool things. So, what are we going to do about this? Uh, drop a comment if you've at least felt at some point that th this is how you felt. You know, you had this, you have this great opportunity, but for some reason that the the inspiration, the, the motivation is just not really coming in. I know I have, and I don't think it's a big deal. I know a lot of, I know some artists who roll their eyes at it and say, hey, if you get creative block, then you're not doing it right, you know, or you're, you shouldn't need to feel inspired. But again, we're going to, we'll get there. We'll talk on that. So that's kind of the scenario that I, I wanted to really address. And key questions here that I want to answer here is why would we be lacking motivation? First of all, I know it sounds simple, but we can't resolve something if we don't actually get into the cause of, of why it happens, right? And then why might we not be inspired? So again, uh, motivated and inspired are a little bit different. We'll talk about those differences. And then of course, the whole reason we're all here is to kind of discuss what solutions might exist. So how could we get around the lack of inspiration or motivation? And I think I've got some good tips that will help. So a lot of these are just based on my own experiences, but also things I've learned from others who I, I really look up to and respect. So uh, cool. So lacking motivation. Um, when we talk about motivation, the word motive means um, the reason someone does something or motivation could be the desire to do something, right? And so if we're lacking that desire, then, then there's, you know, why do we do anything, right? There's always a reward. Uh, interesting life story is I've got a puppy. He's coming on a year old now, and we've been doing lots of training with him. And dogs are really interesting. They live in the moment. They're very simple. They, they're very binary. They see good and bad, yes and no. Um, and, and, and there's either positive or negative reinforcement. And so when he does something we want, we give him a reward for it. And then if he's not doing what we want, we may withhold the reward. We as humans, 
even if we're smarter, so to speak, than dogs, we still do things for a reward. Like we, we show up to work because we collect a paycheck sometimes. Sometimes we show up to work because we need that social interaction. Sometimes we do great work because we know there's notoriety that's going to come from the great work. Or maybe we do great work because we're going to get some sort of social um, accolades. People will like or um, share our work with, with each other. We'll get a pat on the back. Our peers will say, oh, good job, you know. So we do things because there's a reward. Um, working out also, if you've ever tried to get strong and, and, and improve your fitness, you don't get a reward immediately. You might, you might feel good during the workout. You might feel good after you did the workout. But um, it, as soon as you step in the gym, you don't get that reward yet, you know, right? And then long term, you don't maybe change your physique overnight. It might take months. It could take weeks. And we do the hard things because we want that reward more than we don't want the pain associated with not, or sorry, with going through and getting, uh, doing that activity. So just looking at motivation, there's got to be, you know, a reward involved. That's why we do a lot of things. And in some cases, uh, we don't do motive, <clears throat> we, we don't feel motivation because the consequence of not doing something isn't great enough. So this is a pretty uh, crude example here. But imagine someone has a gun to your head and they say, I need you to finish this project by the end of today. There's a good chance you're going to find a way to do it, really, because the consequence of not doing it is so great that when push comes to shove, you do find a way. And this is how a lot of things are in life. The question is, how do we um, either increase the consequence or make ourselves aware of the consequence so that we can, uh, I don't say trick ourselves into it, but feel motivated to do it, right? So if you're aware of what could happen if you actually don't follow through with the, the, the project or the job or the task, that could help give you that kick that you need to move forward, right? So another thing is being spoiled by comfort. And this is an interesting thing because a lot of us so, so we do things that are comfortable too. Uh, we're, we're generally lazy, and if something is more comfortable, then we're gonna do that. And so like people don't take cold showers because it's not as comfortable as a hot shower. <laughs> um, you know, when we're at home, we might like to turn all the lights down low and um, you know, wear our pajamas and have our bowl of uh, cereal while we work in the morning or whatever. Maybe we don't get out of bed for a while, we check emails. Those are, those are us being spoiled by our own creature comforts. And when we get used to that, then that can also uh, form bad habits. We can default to doing what is ever, whatever is comfortable, what is easier instead of what is more difficult. So when, sometimes when we say we're lacking the motivation, sometimes we're just being lazy and we're just doing what's easy or comfortable instead of what is difficult. So another reason we might be lo lacking motivation is we don't have accountability. Again, working from home, you are going to less likely have uh, a, either a network of peers or a, a supervisor, a boss, or people in the office watching over your shoulder, ensuring that you get things done. So without that accountability, again, accountability is kind of like consequence, but um, with accountability, again, you can get away with not doing things, right? No one's forcing you to do something. So one thing I've always found in the past is I've liked working in coffee shops when I was in college, uh, sometimes on the road when I used to travel for work. I would enjoy working in um, hotel lounges and airport lounges or hotel lobbies, things like that, public spaces. And the reason was... and and. I found that when I could work in places where more people around me were, um, especially the airport lounges, um, you had generally people who were more well off, more wealthy. They would wear suits. They uh, were well groomed. They were very uh, polite. They were punctual. They were on time. They're very professional. They were good at what they did. They were high value individuals. And I found that when I was in that environment, 
I found, I felt myself super motivated to do work because there was this accountability. Even though no one knew me, no one cared anything about what I was doing. But mentally, subconsciously, I, I knew that I was being observed in one capacity or another. So if I did work while I was surrounded by all these, you know, professionals, um, it, it, I don't know, it just, it, it, I felt like I was being held accountable. Like I, I should not be seen playing video games or watching a movie when I'm surrounded by people who are just working around the clock. So anyway, accountability. If you don't have it, that could be another reason you're lacking motivation. Another one is simple. Uh, simply, you just don't want whatever you're trying to do enough. And that's brutal, but um, sometimes it's true. Sometimes we are, um, sometimes we're just doing things because we think we want it, but we don't actually want it. And this is, this one's a weird one, but like, if you have a lot of friends or if you follow a bunch of people who do what you think is really cool work and you want to be part of that club, then you want to like, say you do that type of work. But in some cases, maybe you really enjoy consuming, you know, I don't know, let's just say it's, it's environment design for video games. Like, let's say a bunch of your peers you look up to do that type of work and you love consuming that work whether you play video games you just like watching their work but maybe you don't actually enjoy doing that type of work you know some of that work that looks beautiful in the end that you might love may be really really tedious like when you learn that a lot of code is how people go and make some of these visual pieces that you follow uh, or are inspired by you might enjoy the end result but you may not enjoy actually doing the code or learning any of that so in some cases you don't want the thing enough. You don't want to do the work that it takes to get that result. And I'm going to uh, reference a guy. There's going to be a, in the comments of this video, a guy named Eric Thomas. Uh, his nickname is the Hip Hop Preacher. I'm not religious or anything like that. But this guy is just known for his intensity, his clarity, and his, his motivational uh, speaking. And I've linked up a good video of his I really like. He has a lot of good stuff. So he, he gets into this whole, like, do you want it enough? And, you know, uh, watching a few of his videos is like a swift kick in the pants to get you motivated, in my opinion. So another one is uh, you might lack motivation if you're not taking responsibility of what you do. So a lot of us, um, we are very reactive. We kind of sit around and wait for something to happen. We wait for an email. We wait for a lead. We wait for an opportunity. And um, that's not taking responsibility to make things happen. A lot of people just kind of sit out and wait for things to happen and then they react to things. But if you take responsibility, you're actually being the action-oriented one, the one seeking out and taking the action to make things happen. And uh, you're not actually taking responsibility of where you are. A lot of people think they got dealt, you know, um, a poor hand or they got, you know, oh, I'm just not lucky, whatever it is. But in a lot of cases, that type of thinking will never lead to success. So you want to make sure that you take responsibility. You understand that you are where you are because of the things you've done or the things you have not done. So if you continue doing the same, you're not going to change. You need to change what you're doing to change where you're going to be. And the last little bullet I wanted to share with you for lacking motivation is you may be extrinsically motivated, but not intrinsically motivated. And this goes back to a topic I mentioned above, but um, you want to be perceived as someone who does these things, but you may not actually um, want to do these things. So for example, social media is always a, finds its way into every conversation. But if you didn't share, if there was no social media to share your successes, your wins, your losses, the type of work you do, the question is, would you do it at all? A lot of people are motivated by this perception of, oh, I want to be a designer, a car designer, a footwear designer, I want to be a painter, I want to be a photographer, I want to be whatever. If those networks totally disappeared and you had nothing and you couldn't share your work at all with anyone, would you still do it? Um, if the answer is yes, that means you're intrinsically motivated. That means you're doing things for yourself and not just for the accolades you get when you share your work, okay? So sometimes you got to think about that too. If you wouldn't do it, if there was no way to share it with anyone, then there's a good chance you may want to consider doing a different type of work. Okay, and now let's talk about inspiration because all those things were motivation. They have a lot to do with, you know, reward and, and um, you know, the reasons behind doing what you do. 
inspiration has more to do with this um, getting an idea in a clear direction to do something that excites you. That's what I'm going to call inspiration. And what happens is inspiration, being inspired, this it's a state that you feel for a short, well, for a given period of time. Sometimes it's short-lived, sometimes it's, it's a long state. But that inspiration is what... Um, that's that position you want to be in where you're making stuff, ideas and clarity is coming to you and you feel unstoppable, almost like in a flow state. Pardon me. So um, first thing is, I think when you're when you're not feeling inspired, in my experiences, it has to do with over consumption. And I eh, feel free to argue with me on this one, but I think we consume so much media, so much media. And this isn't just social media. This is everything we consume, everything we listen to, everything we watch, everything we uh, partake in, interact with. Those That's overconsumption. So the human brain is not meant to be stimulated around the clock. And what happens is we have these little devices we carry with us that have so much power and so much endless stuff on them, right? So what'll happen is I've, I've noticed in the past where I have, as someone who works from home and has a lot of autonomy, even when I traveled a lot, when I wasn't interacting with a lot of people, I would, uh, I would spend hours every day listening to podcasts, hours listening to um, music. I would spend time watching movies or TV or YouTube or whatever it is. And then I don't play games, but I know a lot of people play little video games here and there. I don't think there's anything bad with video games, but, um, you know, that's another way. So my point is all this, all these things we see, watch and do scrolling on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Dribble, Behance, whatever your, your, your thing is, you are constantly consuming. And what that does is it pacifies your brain. And so your brain has this, uh, once you've conditioned it to consume all the time, it craves consumption. And then um, what you might, if if you're not careful, what you might find yourself doing is jumping from thing to thing to thing, constantly pacifying your brain because your brain doesn't want to work. It doesn't want to be bored. It doesn't want to be forced to, you don't want to be, you don't want to sit in silence. So there's this thing that happens where we just constantly feed our brains things to do so they don't get, so they don't do nothing. And that's damaging because it actually drains our energy. It fatigues us. It, it, it uses up some of our energy that we don't have an endless supply of. So first of all, if you're lacking inspiration, you're probably over consuming. And that may even lead to so many ideas that you don't know where to start and it feels overwhelming and that blocks your inspiration. So another thing that could cause it is no personal connection with a project. So if you are doing a project that you are assigned and you could care less, could not care less about, that can be an issue. And so having uh, some strategies and ways that you can personally connect with the project is important. Uh, so related to that is this topic of empathy. So empathy means that you can uh, relate to and understand and feel the same way about a project that, say, another person does, like your customer. So in a lot of cases, you may simply just not care enough about the client, the project, the target demographic. So whether you're designing for people, whether you are designing for a company, whether you're working on a personal project, if you lack the empathy, you are not really connecting with the person that that project is for. So if you're doing a personal project, maybe you're not being empathetic to the, your intended audience. So if you want to make something that's interesting, then you need to put your shoes in the uh, put yourself in the shoes of your intended audience, the people who you think will find it interesting, and then you need to understand to think what they want to see, and then that's what you go make. If it's for, say you're designing a product for some people, you may not be empathizing. Let's say you're designing a product for an elderly patient who suffers from something, I don't know, arthritis. You may not 
be if if you're not feeling inspired to do this project, you may not be empathetic enough with that person. You may not be relating, especially if you don't suffer that same ill, uh, ail. Um, sorry, if you're not suffering the same pain they are. So, being empathetic to whatever um, you know the your audiences or the the you know the the client or the project that can be pretty important. Um, and if you're not feeling inspired to do the project, you're just not being connected enough. You're not going deep enough. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So another one is lacking inspiration can come from lacking structure. And I know this sounds counterintuitive because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm the creative type. I fly by the seat of my pants. I wear my heart on my sleeve and that's fine. But you need, ins- uh, you need structure to do great work. So Stephen Pressfield wrote um, the book called The um, War of Art, I think is, yeah. And um, it's a great, great, great book. And I love it. I would, I'd highly recommend it. In fact, I think that may be one of the things I've linked up in the description of this video when it's live. But, um, and actually, let me, before I go on too much further, anything I bring up in here, if it's books and stuff like that, there's a good chance it's in my store. And if you get value from these live streams or anything I do, head on over to willgibbons.com slash store like later and check those items out. I have links for all the books and things I really recommend. And if you use those links, it doesn't cost you anything extra, but I get a little affiliate. So Amazon pays me a little money every time I sell something of theirs. So just throwing that out there. If, if these are helpful, you can check the store for things that I mentioned in these videos. But anyway, War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. So cool because Uh, he goes into this whole thing about um, how you can be inspired. And he talks about his muses as his inspiration. And he gets into, uh, he shares a lot of interesting life stories about how he was a struggling writer for the longest time. And then how, like what changes he made in his life that gave him, led to these breakthroughs. And part of what it was, he, I love what he talks about is he talks about the professional creative or the professional And he says, the professional is someone who goes to work. And think of this phrase, go to work. It's a nice little trigger that when I think of, oh, you got to go to work, you got to show up, you got to go to work, that actually flips this thing in your brain. And it says, you need to go do the thing. You have to give yourself a dedicated space and time to do a task. And then you need to go do the task. And you got to be serious and professional about it. And the whole point of me saying structure is he suggests that you need to show up every single day, day in and day out, regardless of how you feel about the work. He said, it's not about working when you feel inspired. It's about working regularly and often enough that you can create good work without the need to feel inspired. The more work you do, the more time you carve out to do the work, the more chances you will become inspired. It's a little bit of a, a, a trained behavior, but it will happen more naturally if you have this regular routine, okay? We'll get more into that. Another thing is if you're lacking inspiration, I think you haven't dove deep enough into the subject. Sorry, dived, dove, dive. You haven't gone deep enough into the subject that you are trying to. So a lot of people, um, they stay very surface level. So let's say I want to do a a creative project in which I design a camera. Well, most people are going to go to Pinterest or Instagram and they're going to get a bunch of cool pictures of cameras that they like. They're going to save them. And then they're going to go to the uh, pe- uh, pen and paper and they'll sketch out some some ideas based on what they've seen. And then they'll go and try to create some cool renderings and then they'll call it done. And 99% of those designs are going to suck. Sorry, they will. And that's that's fine. Not everything has to be a masterpiece. But if you're not feeling inspired, it sounds like you might be following, following a kind of a mechanical um, path. Like you've been trained to... Okay, you go, you grab your, your, your reference, you, you, you do your sketches, and then you go refine, and then you render it out or whatever. The problem with that is you're not diving deep. You're not doing anything interesting related to the project. So for example, if, if we were to take that camera example, um, you need to go deep on a subject. Let's say you're going to design a camera, give yourself some constraints and get specific about it. Maybe it's a camera that's gonna work in outer space, Maybe they work in, I mean, whatever. The point is a camera that's going to work in a certain location, maybe a camera that's going to function differently, maybe a camera that's either big or small or for someone who's handicapped or someone who's who's more able-bodied, or maybe um, it's going to be a camera for someone who can't see properly, or I don't know. There's a lot of things 
that you can do. And maybe you're gonna, instead of that, maybe you're like, well, I wanna create a camera that decomposes. That's weird, that's crazy, that's cool though. Or maybe a camera just from recycled materials. Or maybe you wanna make a camera where the lens, maybe you redefine how lenses work and they don't become this big long thing on the front of a camera anymore. Um, the point is asking weirder questions, going deeper or connecting the, the, you know, taking some kernel of an idea that is different, strange, interesting, curious, um, you know, asking questions that force you to go deeper on a project. I think that's going to give you, make you feel more inspired because um, uh, I think, I think he said it, but <clears throat> the author of this book, Mastery, which you've probably heard mentioned before, Mastery is a beautiful book by uh, written by a guy named Robert Green. There's actually two books called Mastery by two different um, authors. Robert Green's version of Mastery is what I highly recommend. is my is one of my favorite books. It's so good and um, so well written, and that will inspire you to be excellent at what you do. And I think one thing that he, I think one of the people he talks about, says something like problems or fields of topics of in, uh, topics become more interesting the more you develop a mastery of them. So some people would think, hold on a second, niching down or becoming a specialist in something, that's just going to limit my opportunities to do other interesting work. And that's not true. Many professionals have proven that the more specialized, the deeper you go, the more you examine something, the more interesting the problems and the discoveries become. So that will, that will make you feel inspired. And, and that book, Mastery by Robert Greene, is phenomenal. So, okay, so we've talked a lot about these, uh, why we might be lacking motivation, why we might be lacking inspiration. And what I wanna do is talk about solutions here. And I'm going to go through things that I think will answer or speak to some of these topics we already uh, acknowledged here. I'm gonna take a quick moment for a coffee break and to look at the comments. Um, Yeah, limiting your uh, media consumption can be a big one. Um, I struggle with this a lot too. I take little, and in fact, I'm planning on taking a break coming up here pretty soon. And I don't have specific dates yet, but I'm gonna be going on vacation in a couple weeks. And I think I might pull the brakes on YouTube for a while. Same with uh, Instagram, everything really. Okay, so let's talk about solutions here. Um, these are my solutions. These are what I think you should do to help uh, feel motivated and inspired much more often, okay? First and foremost, have a dedicated space. Doesn't have to be a separate room. Could be an, uh, could be, I, I don't know. Everyone has different living situations, but have a space. It could be the corner of your bedroom. Could be part of your bedroom that you create, like put a curtain around. I don't know, you separate the space somehow. It doesn't really matter, but have a space that is your dedicated creative space. Um, if you can afford it, I know everyone's budget's different, but like get creative. Don't always buy things new, buy things used secondhand, borrow them from families, garage sales, whatever it takes, but build yourself a dedicated space, have as much optimal furniture. So if you're somebody who needs to sit and stand a lot, you know, uh, get a sit stand desk, um, have lighting. That's good. So I find myself, at, you know, working like in a cave with everything dark and everything like that but have optimal lighting. There's a reason professional studios and workplaces have that pain in the butt fluorescent lighting. Now, I'm not saying go fluorescent, but I'm saying go bright daylight bulbs, go, it, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Like I've got these smart Philips Hue bulbs in here and sometimes like I have fun settings where I can go all cyberpunk mode and everything's pink and blue and stuff like that. And that puts me in a great mood to create. The point is have some tools in your space that help make you want to be creative and inspired. Decorate it. Some people are minimalist like me. I don't like to have a ton of decor. My desk is generally bare bones. I have nothing behind me on the wall to look at here and uh, behind the camera. Some people like to have a bunch of little trinkets that get them in the mood, you know? So work is, uh, so, so, so that's the first one is have a, have a dedicated space if you can. Um, the next one is work is supposed to be hard, okay? Consider that. People who say do what you love and you won't work a day in, in your life, I think that's BS. I truly think that's BS. I think it's a little bit arrogant. It's frou-frou. It's optimistic. People love to say it, but it doesn't mean it. I, I, 
every job becomes a job. Everything you do to get compensated becomes work and some days are better than other days, okay? That's just reality. Anyone who says they, they, they don't feel like they work at all, they're lying <laughs> and that's okay. Um, it's exciting to say that, but it's not always true. So work is supposed to be hard, but at home we're taught to be lazy and seek comfort, right? We make our houses cozy. We have mood lighting, we have comfortable lighting, we lay down in bed and we have this nice couch and it's just the right temperature, it's not too cold so you never have to wear a sweater inside, all those things, right? We make home comfortable, but the problem is work is supposed to be hard, right? Good work is challenging work. And if your space that you're doing work at, especially if you now work from home, is, is, is like your home, these two things are at odds. You can't have, um, you know, you can't always just be like lazy and comfortable like you are at home when you're supposed to be working at home. That can make it hard too. So because these two are two things are at odds, I personally think that your workspace should be a little less comfortable, so to speak, than the rest of your house, right? And you shouldn't do things like watch Netflix in the same space that you do work. If you can afford it, I know not everyone's fortunate enough to, but if you can kind of create some separation from where you, where work gets done and where how like being lazy in the house gets done, that can go a long way. So another thing is if working from home, you need to condition yourself to do difficult things. And I know this is debatable, but I think the more things you do that are difficult, the easier it is to work when you don't feel like it, okay? And uh, this is interesting, like, um, Taking cold showers is another good example. Um, I know some people, it's not a big deal. Like some people are like, sure, I'll take cold showers. And then there's people who like, they're like, you couldn't pay me a hundred bucks a month to take a cold shower, right? I know people like that. And here's the thing. It's not any harder than taking a warm shower, but it's the decision. Some people make decisions and are just like, yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. And they just do it because that's how they are. Other people like to think about, hmm, do I want to do it? And then they talk themselves out of it, right? So I think that you need to condition yourself to do hard things. The next time you have two options and you could do something that's difficult or not difficult, just try doing the difficult one without thinking about it and condition yourself to do that. And the next time you have a big task in front of you, you are going to be more likely to just do it, which is uh, pretty cool. <clears throat> Another thing is putting up blinders to everything else while working. And this is tough. This goes more like in a focus, but declining anything that could distract you. So I have a door shut on my, uh, in my room here, and, and I try to do that to prevent myself from going and doing other things. Don't answer the door. Don't do the dishes. Don't do the laundry. Don't pick up your phone. Don't respond to emails if you can. Try to ignore everything else while doing your work. And um, even if you know there's tasks you have to do, it's really hard. When I transition to working from home, see, I'm such a task guy. I like to make big lists and I like to do all the things. But the problem is when I transition to working from home, I found myself more likely to go find ways to procrastinate. I would do the dishes. I would go sweep out, uh, out in front of the house to get all the leaves off the walkway. I would vacuum the floor. I would go put things away, you know, in the bathroom, whatever it was. I found ways to procrastinate and the problem with that was, is I was distracting myself um, and procrastinating from the work I had to do, of course. So <clears throat> point being, sorry, I lost my notes. Let me pull this up real quick. Um, so the point being here is that, you know, try to put up your blinders and just focus on the task at hand while you're actually doing it. I know that's ironic that I kind of lost my focus here, but I'm, I want to make sure that I have my notes here. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is having an in the zone playlist. So I have, again, and we'll have a link in the description of this video that is going to take you to my Spotify playlist. I have a, a playlist I created on Spotify called like studio playlist or something. It's the first thing I made. Um, well, not the first thing, but I've had it for like four or five years. And I've taken soundtracks that are uh, from, from films and, and movies and games that I like and this playlist, uh, the soundtrack playlist, doesn't have a lot of like vocals and stuff. It's mostly ambient and it's very like, um, you know, some is really chill, some is more intense, but it's a studio playlist that I turn on every time I work. And I have listened to this playlist hundreds, hundreds of times, and that's not an exaggeration. And I've 
and I, I've put it on so many times that just like Pavlov's dog salivated, so he did this experiment where like ring a bell and then pay a treat, then the dog started to learn every time he heard the bell, he was gonna get a treat. So he started to drool or salivate every time he heard the bell. That bell, that, that salivation was a conditioned response. That's what that's called. You expose yourself to the same thing every time and then this reward comes. Well, I found that by listening to the soundtrack, I would um, condition myself to get in the, the mood to work and focus. And the music itself was quite inspiring and relaxing at the same time. And it helped me turn off outside distractions while listening to this music. And I've listened to this so many times that it's almost lost its meaning. I almost don't even hear it. I just turn the playlist on and I start listening and then it pulls me into focus mode. And, and so anyway, I have that linked up so you can check it out just to give you some ideas. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, have these little triggers to help get you into that flow state when you hear that. So when I hear that, if I'm the dog in this situation, I hear that music start playing in the office and then all of a sudden I start working. It's just like my reaction to it, right? So the next thing I wanna mention is having a bias for action. And I think this is something, uh, it's a practice that's largely practiced in um, lots of kind of military armed forces sort of things. Um, and that's where they say like every second counts. So if they sit there thinking about what to do next, it could cost people their lives. So in this case, like having a bias for action if you sit there and think about it, you can just think, 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 think and lose momentum. Whereas having a bias for action means you're going to jump into action. Now, it doesn't mean skip over the planning phase of a project if you need to, but it means just sitting down and doing it without asking what you want to do. So when you sit down at your desk to start working, you don't open 50 tabs and go, okay, got to get my Instagram checkup. I got to check in on Pinterest, got to check in on Facebook. I got to watch these videos, got to read this blog. Like, if you do that, that's damaging. You're gonna you're gonna create the wrong habit. But if you have this action where you sit down and as soon as you get in that seat, you start like you're like clock's ticking, gotta go, gotta shut this task down, gotta get the thing done. Develop that bias for action, and it's going to again, it's like it's like conditioning yourself to do hard things, right? That will help quite a bit. So another one we talked about is accountability. So staying accountable is important. So one thing that you can leverage social media for, or at least the people you know in real life if you have peers around you, significant others, family members, make yourself accountable. So if you're doing the thing that you that needs to be done, share it with somebody and be like, you know, I need I need you to check in. I need you to ask me how much progress I made on this each day. And in the I think I have a guide on my learning page <clears throat> of my website which is like how to learn any software in 30 days and I know it sounds kind of clickbaity but it's a framework that I built that I like to use and I highly recommend anytime you need to learn something new like a like a software or a language or something and part of that is kind of accountability and um, you kind of can share like hey I'm going to be doing this thing for 30 days I need you to check in every single day ask me what to do or you publicly you put yourself out on the line right and another way you can stay accountable is something called an anti-charity, I think is what they're called. It's interesting. You can pledge like, I don't know, a certain amount of money to go to an orga organization you really do don't like. So like for me personally, I would say a good anti-charity would be anything that supports the US president. So I could say like, and it has to be a painful amount of money. It has to be like, if I lose this amount of money, it's going to really make me upset. Like thousand bucks or something like that if, if you can afford it or whatever it is so i would pledge that to the anti-charity and what there's websites that hold your money so you, so the money's already been transferred but they hold it until you get to the end of your goal and 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 that type of thing and so basically it, it, you'd be going man like if i don't do this thing then my money's going to go to this this charity that i don't want to support and you know uh, that can really help fuel your your need to do the thing stay keep accountable right so another thing a uh, solution for all this could be to um, consider what people would do to have the privileges you have and that's this may not work for everyone but understand there are people who would um, give anything to be in your position a lot of us are really fortunate in in the developed world who have things like computers access to software 
a roof over our head. The fact that I have a dedicated space to do my work in um, is crazy. I know there are, there are entire families that are large who don't have this much room, who don't live in this much luxury. And I'm fortunate every day. So really kind of count your blessings and think like, think how, how, how bad it would look for you to have as much privilege as you have. And then to just not really do anything with it. Right. Like lacking inspiration and motivation. It's like you have every advantage you need, just go do it. Right. So that's another thing to think about. Um, another thing is reciting the, uh, consequences of action versus inaction. So we talked about consequence, right? Like, but don't just say like, well, if I don't do this project, it's going to be bad. You can be like, what is the cost of me not doing this, this per, these personal projects? Let's say I have three personal projects that I want to do or they're not finished. I ask myself, what is the cost of them not getting into my portfolio in the next three months or two months, whatever? You can be like, well, the, the cost or the consequences, I could be stuck doing what I'm doing. Let's say you want to leave your job and there's things that need to be done. Oh, you need a website. You need to whatever, get, get your your portfolio together, you can ask yourself, what are the consequences of not doing that? And if you're like, well, the consequences that I stay at my job who that I don't really like, and I keep getting paid and I keep having benefits and I get to do whatever I want on the weekend. It's like for a lot of people, the consequence of not taking action is not that painful. They're like, eh, I'm collecting a paycheck. I've got a home over my head. I've got health insurance, whatever it is. That's not painful. But people who leave their job and are like, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to feed my family. Okay, that is motivating. So like, you have to kind of understand what the consequences of action versus inaction are. And you need to find ways to frame it so that you realize that if you don't do the thing, you're going to be in more pain than if you just do the thing. Uh, so that brings me to deadlines, setting deadlines. Uh, this is one that a lot of people struggle with because when you're doing something outside of your job where your boss can't just say, hey, it's got to be done by Thursday, people just let projects take on a life of their own. And there's this thing called um, Parkinson's Law. It basically says work will expand to fill the time available for its completion. So if you give it two weeks or two months or two years, a project will take that long, right? In the In the past where I had projects that were just kicking around for over a year, I was like, okay, they have to get done. And I let them become this big project that I just want to be perfect. And in reality, I just set myself a two week deadline on each one. And I just forced myself to work around the clock on it. Guess what? I got them out there and I was so happy to have them done and published. Um, so set short deadlines. Don't set yourself long deadlines. Uh, quitting social media, YouTube, video games, et cetera, for 30 days. This is one I recommend. We talked about this, but I think that the book by, um, is it, it's, uh, oh no, let me check. Oh boy. Digital minimalism. Um, escaping me right now. Digital minimalism, Cal Newport. I, I mentioned it one of the last live streams. He has a whole thing on how, on the cost of bombarding your brain with consuming social media, um, it will motivate you. And if you just take a client like detox for 30 days, just, just turn it all off. I think you're going to start finding two things because I've done this before myself. You'll find these, you'll find more frequently, you'll have these like moments of clarity where uh, a spark will bring you like a clear direction of an idea. And, um, your brain will be able to stay thinking about a topic longer than it than it will currently right now our brains kind of like you know they're like the dog that gets distracted by every moving thing like a new squirrel right you know whereas like when you de when you deprogram your brain to need that next hit of dopamine you can kind of uh stay thinking on a topic much deeper and get more meaning out of it so anyway digital detox i recommend it um so also, having a sense of purpose, we talked about this before too, but uh, Start With Why is a great book called uh, by Simon Sinek, and Starting With Why, the whole point of that is, is for most people, actually, this is probably one of the bigger ones, is for most people lacking motivation is they don't have a purpose that is larger than, than themselves. So 
let's say you are some sort of uh, concept designer and you do things, uh, you create cool things and you're like, oh yeah, it's great, but I just don't feel motivated. Sometimes you might be doing, you don't know what your why is. Like I've, t- uh, I think the easiest example to point to is a lot of people who become first time parents and I'm not a parent, but my younger brother is. And a lot of my peers are. And I know that when they they have their first child, they say everything changes. You have a purpose in life at that point. And everything revolves around uh, doing things so that kid can have a good life, right? And so having that purpose that is greater than you is really important. A lot of people who do charity work, who do uh, work in the healthcare fields, who do, you know, there's a lot of people who do great work. And what gets them up in the morning every day is because they know that what they do is not just for themselves. Because to be honest, we don't, if, if all we ever did was anything was just for ourselves, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do a lot. But a lot of people who have a sense of purpose and know that their work is to benefit more people or better other people's lives, then they are likely to remain inspired more. So starting with why and knowing what your why is, is really important. <clears throat> So another thing that I want to suggest is uh, creating a structured regular practice. And we talked about this uh, with the whole um, War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. But another thing, uh, so there's a a writer I look up to in respect, Stephen King, uh, the master of the horror genre, right? So he is famous for writing 2,000 words per day. That's his quota. And he has uh, allegedly kept up this habit for uh, decades And what he does is he says the first thing he does in the morning, and he doesn't allow anything to get in the way of that. He doesn't take appointments, calls, schedule, nothing until those first 2,000 words have been written. And so he basically doesn't do anything until anywhere between like 11 and 1 p.m., like lunchtime. That's how long it takes him to get his first 2,000 words of the day done, and then he can go do other things in his life. And there, it is no coincidence that he has written prolifically and done well and it's it's not because he's just full of great ideas it's because he has become a master he has spent the time he is he's shown up every day and he has done the hard thing every day and he's been able to create so much good content that eventually you know he's he's seen as a master at what he does so um again war of art by stephen pressfield kind of talks a lot about that stuff and the last thing I have here is, is go down that rabbit hole. So much deeper than you um, have on any subject and ideally deeper than anyone else has. And this comes from that book, Mastery, like I talked about by Robert Greene. So when you go and start examining a topic, the deeper you go, the more interesting it's going to get, the better questions you're going to ask. And if you learn more about something than most people, then you're going to start asking questions that other people have not asked. And if your art or your work or your design sets out to explore or answer those hard questions that no one else has asked, that is what's going to get you noticed. It's what's going to get you interested further in the, the things you do. And it's going to allow you to do something truly unique that, that other people have not, which is really interesting and exciting. So going down that rabbit hole is really important. Make sure you're working. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm so sorry. But yeah, so going down that rabbit hole and really diving deeper into that project on that subject than than other people have. Anyone of notoriety, anyone who's won any major awards uh, for research or you know Nobel Peace Prize or whatever it might be, these are people who have gone deeper, asked the harder questions, and sought out uh, answers or novel approaches to things that um, other people haven't. So. Uh, just remember that interest, your interest in a subject is likely to grow with the depth in which you explore that subject, okay? So we're coming up on the hour. I'm going to conclude here with five takeaways that I think are, um, you know, they may not be the best, the top five for everyone here, but I think that these top, these are like my top five that if I had to give you tips on how to stay inspired, how to stay motivated from working, especially if you're working from home, I'm going to say number one, have a dedicated space. Number two, build structure in your routine. Number three, have a sense of purpose. Know why you're doing what you're doing. Four, dive deep. And five, consider the consequences of not doing what you need to do. 
So that'll round it out. Again, uh, hopefully I provided enough context for all those five bullet point summaries that you can understand why those are important and what you can actually take action on to do those. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and call it a day for now. Uh, I'm gonna go read the comments and, and chat with you guys for a few minutes before shutting this thing down. Um, if you have to go though, guys, thanks for spending your time with me today. And um, you know, let me know if you have any sort of requests for future topics or anything like that. Okay, um, comment section here. We've got, um, if you dig a little, you find, uh, learn a little, if you dig, oh, sorry. If you dig a little, you find a little. And if you dig deep, you find a plenty. Tamil proverb. Love it. That's great. And that's that's reinforcing that point we said earlier by going deep, right? I love it. Um, yeah, Art said as much as I love my job and enjoy it. Some days are freaking mine, uh, exhausting. Yeah, they are. Um, I'll be honest here. Uh, the irony of this live stream is that this week has been a struggle for me, for sure. Um, I felt like an imposter when I was kind of outlining everything here. But I realized like, look, I'm a human just like everyone else is. I have great days. I have great weeks. I have months where things go really well. And then I'll have days or weeks where I'm like down in the dumps. And that's that happens. Like that makes you a human. So that's okay. Just um, the more we can be strategic about what we do and how we respond to these scenarios, <clears throat> the better, the quicker we can recover from and rebound when things do go bad, if that makes sense. That's I agree with you there. Yeah, Gokul was saying, yeah, phones with a reduced attention span. It's an interesting thing on that digital minimalism book. What 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 Cal Newport gets into is talking about um, this thing called um, uh, not isolation. What is it? it it's called. It's a uh, hmm. I forget what it's called. Uh, it's not lonely. It's not being bored. It's like when you don't have anything. It's like doing nothing, kind of. Um, just being okay with doing nothing. Like you don't have to be always thinking of something. You don't always have to be solving a problem. You don't always have to be consuming or listening to something or educating yourself. People are really uncomfortable with sitting alone, not doing anything, not having, not taking action on something. It's just hard for people to do, right? I myself included in that. And he said, the better you can become at just being okay with that silence, the better, like things happen in your brain chemically that will make you more creative when you focus that energy, so to speak. And yes, all, all the UX uh, user experience uh, people are designed to cater to a short attention span. Yep, and in fact, they are, um, they're also good at trying to keep people on platforms by feeding them shorter snippets of media, you know, for sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Chris Scott, thanks for joining. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, DS says, uh, hi from India. Um, took notes. Awesome, man. Thanks. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say man. I'm not sure. Uh, appreciate it, though. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good session. Awesome. Um, yeah, red flag on media consumption. It's it's tough because I know a lot of us basically exist on social media. Like, if it weren't for that, it's like, would anyone know what you're up to? But I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and share it. I've, I've been... I don't know exactly when, but I'm going to take a break from social media um, in the near future. So I've been spending a lot of this year uh, creating a platform where I share as much as I can um, from these live streams, as well as uh, tutorials on, on Keyshot and rendering. And I'd like to do more, like more topics and stuff, but um, you know, it always comes down to time. But the more time I spend working with and sharing what I know and, and working with others on, on learning content, the less time I spend um, learning for myself and learning new challenging topics and creating new personal work. So in the past, before I taught and shared as much, I would spend all my spare time going and learning and making new stuff. And I like to, I, I get this hit of nostalgia when I look back at my old posts from like 2014, 15, 16, 17, where I was 
doing these little art projects, just personal little like, oh, somebody made a cool image that inspired me. And then I would go and do that thing on my own. And then I wrote a little blog post and I shared some behind the scenes shots and stuff. And those, it's not like those were getting a lot of traffic. I wasn't even pushing them on Instagram. I wasn't drawing attention to them. It, it, it was just, I was doing it for me, for me, right? And those were the seeds of what got me to where I am now. And I think that, um, I think that I'd like to return to that for a little while because, you know, I feel like life is like a pendulum. There is no balance. I think we spend time here, then the pendulum swings back and we spend time over here and then back over here. And there are these kind of seasons and we need to focus our attention on different areas and then bounce back to other areas. So I'm hoping to take a little bit of a, uh, a break here and recharge my own batteries from a creative standpoint and, and create some new work and learn some new stuff to share with everybody and then come back and then, you know, bring it all back to you guys, hopefully. So, um, yeah, that's what's happening in my world. Hopefully you guys are doing well. I know, I know we're in what feels like a long stretch of, um, you know, quarantines and life has been on upside down for a while. A lot of us working from home and there's been a lot of challenges with that. Hopefully you guys are hanging in there. Um, you know, connecting with other people is important. Hangouts like this, chatting with other people is important. So once again, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for hanging out with me. And, um, you know, if you made it this far, check the links in the description. I don't know on a live chat if um, there is a description below the video with links, but um, if not, it there will be later when it goes live and I'll have everything I mentioned in here linked out. And uh, yeah, guys, until next time, happy rendering. I'll see you guys later.